Hello, welcome to the Music Ally Focus podcast with me, Music Ally's editor Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're joined by Leo Tibon, former COO of Tidal and now co founder of music financing platform Duetti, which aims to let smaller and mid range artists sell part or all of their catalogue. He's got experience in both the investment and streaming sides of the music business. And so we wanted to talk about two things that are distantly yet directly connected. The recently mooted or indeed implemented artist-centric payment systems that you have read about and the service that Duetti provides, which gives artists another route to the money that their songs will make. All of that in just one minute. Now, each Music Ally Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time, and so, therefore, this podcast is going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as Adam Winrich could hypothetically catch 450 bottles with a bullwhip. Adam caught 18 in one minute in 2015, and we would genuinely like to know how you find out that you have an aptitude for that. And as an aside, by the way, on the very same day, Adam broke the record as well for the most roses cut from a person's mouth using bolas, which is a sort of throwing weapon, in two minutes. What a day that was for him. Remember, life is short, so make the most of it, friends. Now, Leo Tibon started out in finance and then jumped into the music industry as COO of Tidal. Now he's combining the two areas of interest and work at Duetti, using data to predict the values of songs and then paying the rights holders for all or parts of them. And he's not aiming for the big names necessarily, but also looking at the small to medium-sized artists with a successful catalogue. So he talked to me about who would benefit the most if an artist-centric system was widely rolled out and whether it would please the artists who have been calling for a fairer remuneration model. He then also talks about Duetti's work, who they target and how artists may use services like this to unlock value from their songs alongside other forms of streaming income. Let's go and talk to Leo right now. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Leo Tibon to the podcast. Hello, Leo. Hey there, Joe. Thanks for having me. Uh, Great uh, to have you on the podcast. Now, we're going to talk about two topics today that are connected, uh, but also separate, if you see what I mean. Artist-centric payments and your perspective on that from your background uh, working in that area, and then also what you're doing uh, at Duetti at the moment. Um, But before we get into all that, can you just give us a little bit of context so we all understand where you're coming from? So your background, please, and what you do at Duetti and what Duetti does as well. Sure, absolutely. I'll start, I'll start with my background and then uh, move over to, to Duetti itself. Uh, and so for myself, I started my career almost 15 years ago um, in finance. And so I worked as an investment banker uh, in London uh, for over five years. And that, that was really my first introduction into kind of the music world. I worked on a number of transactions that was in the pre-streaming days. And so music was in a very different shape and, and size uh, versus where it is today. And through that work, I got connected to Rock Nation, uh, Jay-Z's music company uh, out of New York, uh, and moved over uh, to work in a special team that was set up uh, to start Tidal, the music streaming company that Jay founded uh, in early 2015. Uh, And since then, for for just over seven years, uh, I was with Tidal, uh, one of the first employees. I was then the COO, led big parts of the business, uh, through a lot of ups and downs and kind of throughout kind of the streaming um, taking over the world. In 2021, the comp- title was sold to Jack Dorsey and, and Square. And so kind of worked on the equity transaction, stayed with Square for a year. And after that, I left uh, to start uh, Duetti. Right. Uh, and what is Duetti? What is, is that sort of bringing those two worlds back together again, isn't it? It is. And it's, it's interesting you said that. That's exactly how I think about my own kind of personal career journey, um, kind of really combining finance and music uh, and tech uh, into, into one platform. And so Duetti, in a very simple way, uh, we buy catalogs, right? We buy all music. Uh, we're one of many, right? There's, of course, many different companies and funds and financial players that are doing it. And it seems to be uh, headlines every other week on, on kind of a new big transaction that's happening in the space. But we're trying to do it very differently. And the way that it's different is that we're only focused on uh, transactions and artists that I would say are not the multi-million dollar kind of A-list type transactions, but actually going uh, going and talking and partnering with artists that maybe are more DIY, 
um, maybe it's transactions that are more in the five figures or six figures as opposed to kind of this kind of multi-million dollar um, uh, deals that are happening. And, and so, so to do that, um, we have to utilize a, a lot of data, right? And so we started by setting up uh, a very strong data science team. And so we're able to uh, kind of mine the data and understand it really, really well, because instead of kind of doing like a top down, like big analysis, we really need to understand the dynamics of, of tracks that maybe are not as large and as, as some of the deals we read about in the press. Um, and we're coming, we're coming to that from that approach in order to basically provide transparent pricing and allow, allow artists to access this type of financing that previously has really only been available only if you're kind of an, uh, kind of a superstar A-lister. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. That's it's a good in the nutshell description, and we'll we'll dig into that in a little bit uh, and reconnect everything. Um, but first of all, you obviously have this kind of interesting perspective because you've you've worked on the investment side of well in, in investment banking, but also on the investment side of music, but also on the streaming side itself. So where streaming meets finance um, and, and meets money. And, and that's an interesting dynamic that we want to sort of take advantage of here a little bit. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk to you about are artist-centric payment models, which we've, we've obviously heard a lot about recently. At Music Ally, we've been writing about different forms of um, artist streaming payment models for quite a long time now. There was user-centric models, and now we're talking about artist-centric models. Um, so, so I just I'm interested to hear from your perspective, with your background of working on those two sides of the business. Can you how would you describe an artist centric model as you see it for our listeners, and how does it work? Right. Well, I, I, th- that's a great question because people talk about a lot of different concepts, and it's kind of it's it, it gets very complicated uh, quickly. But if I'm trying to kind of zoom out and, and think about what it means um, and, and kind of simplify it, I think artist-centric, first of all, it's a term that was coined, I believe, by Universal Music Group over the past couple of years to try to introduce a set of, a set of tweaks to the royalty kind of payment model. Um, and I, I think we can identify two fundamental elements that are part of that kind of umbrella term. The first element is really trying to tweak the system in a way that uh, shifts royalties to some extent at least from non-human, non-walking artist sources into walking artists, right? So think, let's think about AI-driven music, white noise, even some fraudulent behavior. Um, today, as we all know, uh, those streams are way exactly the same. And so the idea here is to shift resources from from kind of that group into walking artists human artists that clearly need um, to make a living and so that's the, the first element the second element of, of this term um, has been used to address or try to introduce some type of distinction between artists that have proactive listeners that are actively searching for them and seek out their music, versus artists with music that is more of a lean back consumption that the algorithms or radio functions, et cetera, are pushing uh, into, into the streaming service. And so th- those two different kind of fundamental elements, one is uh, shifting royalties from machine into human, and secondly, shifting royalties from lean back into more proactive listening patterns. And th- those two elements are kind of been grouped under this one uh, umbrella uh, of these artist-centric uh, models. We've existed in this world where, as you said, anything over 30 seconds on a streaming platform is worth the same as something else. And I feel sorry for anyone who uploads a, you know, a, a, a beautiful one-hour piece of music because you're getting paid the same as someone who has a 45-second track. Um, but, then, but then beyond that, we're talking about something a little bit nuanced here, which is, well maybe white noise is not worth the same as a pop song. Now, the argument we've always used here on Music Ally is if you've got a screaming six-month-old baby who won't sleep unless you're playing white noise, you would strongly disagree with that, right? And there's a, there's a functionality to that noise. Um, but, but then the, the, the other side you were talking about there is the idea that um, beyond the sort of human-machine debate, that there is a sort of 
tiering from the consumption side. So, you know, if, if I listen, to, if I go and choose to listen to an album, it's a very meaningful thing. And it's under this argument, it's worth more than if I click play and then go off and work and a song plays and I'm sort of aware of it, but it washes over me a bit. What, what's your opinion? Can we talk about the latter one of those first, which is about the uh, the intention of the listener what's your feelings there about value in terms of their behavior right joe so i first of all i fully agree it's 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 kind of a very complicated debate um there are a lot of nuances to it um to your question i think i i, I sympathize with the with the principle but i think that as as you start thinking about how to apply that principle in practice you end up um, with a lot of different challenges in applying it in kind of consistent way across the board and in a way that everyone would feel comfortable with. Um, n- not to go into too much detail, but there is a lot of fine tuning. What is proactive listening? Is it if you're searching for an artist's name and the, the first play that comes from that? Is it if you go to their artist page and scroll down and find something? Um, it's 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 not that simple, and so then it, it starts getting into kind of very specific details that ultimately can have a lot of influence on how royalties are being calculated and distributed. And so, while I have some sympathy with kind of this idea or principle, I suspect that the implementation could be so complicated that you may end up the or- may may end up losing the original intent and create a, a series of different distortions and, and, and kind of be counterproductive. Ultimately, with, with the final point that I would make, that there is an advantage ultimately for simplicity in understanding and forecasting um, royalty receipts for artists and their teams. And so the more complicated it is, the more difficult it is to keep streaming services honest and to understand how much you're going to get um, next year and the year after that. What I'm trying to get to is who's going to benefit here if if a system changes, you like you said, it's immediately complicated trying to define this, you know, and predicting the future, future earnings, but also understanding behavior of fans is something everybody wants, right? What's the counter argument? Is, is it as simple as, well, you know, if you've got lots of real fans, they'll come and seek out your music and play it a lot more and therefore you'll be better off. But what, do you think that will actually bear out in, in reality? I don't. And that's that's exactly kind of the point I'm trying to make. I think once you introduce all those different tweaks and complications into the system, as always, there will be people that will look to game the system and, and find those loopholes. And so going back to kind of the, the previous question, out of those two elements, I think I have a lot more sympathy to the first challenge, which is a machine versus human and trying to solve that. And I think that could be a lot easier to solve versus challenge number two, which is kind of this real fans versus non-real fans and so on and so forth. And so I would definitely, and and, and frankly, and and you ask who stand to to benefit, um, if I'm being a bit critical or cynical, I would say that conflating the two concepts under one debate um, is is fairly intentional um, in order to benefit um, those who are trying to divert some royalty payouts into the more proactive listening patterns, which benefits typically bigger artists and and the labels that stand behind them, and so and so there's definitely some some kind of uh, you know c- c- complex uh, argument that's being made that can actually be simplified, uh, but it's almost like it's intentionally intertwined uh, between the two. It, it, it's. It's it's almost philosophical in a sense, isn't it? Because you've got, you know, to, to go back to the example of, uh, uh, let's say, white noise versus a pop song that has been that we all we know takes hundreds of hours of, of crafting to get to, to just produce one song and ten thousand hours of, of of time before that um, versus white noise, which can be generated and it's essentially, perhaps, you know, cynically again, I would say, is being uploaded to try and make some money from the system of people looking to to use it that seems fairly clear doesn't it but we we have spoken to a lot of artists over the last few years who have been very vocal voicing their concerns about uh 
what they're getting paid from streaming platforms. There's campaigns like the UK's Broken Record campaign, the equivalents in many countries around the world, including the US where you are at the moment. And they're looking for a fairer remuneration model. Do, do you think something like that, which is around um, d- distinguishing between uh, like artist-led music and let's say other sound, other forms of sound that is also getting paid the, the same royalty rate. Do you think that that is a beneficial step forward? I think it, it's beneficial on the margin, but it's not going to change the underlying fundamentals of the, the royalty payment flows um, uh, in, in the industry, right? And that's, I think, a very important point to make. We're debating, right? And we're kind of going into the minutia of how you design the specific rules of the existing system. But ultimately, even under the most, um, I would say, far-reaching proposals that I've seen, and I've done the back of the envelope math on, you're talking about the changes of, you know, five, seven, maybe as 10% in terms of how the royalties are being distributed. For a company like Universal Music, that can mean many million, ma- many millions of dollars of difference. So I can understand why they are focused on that. But I think for the broader community, it's not going to change that much, right? We're only discussing how to divide the pie. We're not as focused on increasing the pie, which is really where where we can get a lot of growth from. And that's the most important debate, in my opinion. Right, and this sort of brings us towards what, what you're talking about with Duetti, where, as you said at the beginning, you're not... You, well, I'll get you to sort of explain how it works in a minute, but you're you're aiming it at not the triple A superstar artists at the top, which we are seeing in a lot of, let's say, catalog sales or fractional ownership businesses and things like that. Um, but what we're talking about here is perhaps another path for artists that are in the in, in the long, you know, in the sort of fatter part of the long tail in in the graph. So, is before we talk about Duetti directly, is is do you think that a likely outcome for where we're going in terms of income around recorded music for artists is that there will be a limited amount. Let's think about an, a hypothetical artist who is not a superstar, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a limited amount that they're going to be able to get from um, streaming platforms uh, around their music. But then actually there's going to be, they, they could think about using other technologies, other financial systems and other income streams to inflate their, their income in other ways. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, exactly right. Like artists, I think, are becoming more and more sophisticated in terms of how they manage their affairs. Um, they're, they're managing their, their music career as kind of a small business that's developing multiple revenue streams, uh, if you'd like. Um, and I think, that, and that's a really critical point, the music industry and, and, and musicians do benefit from the availability of a lot of data that's been recorded. Um, and then that allows them to, and, and folks that work with them or make, uh, or make business propositions to them to understand in a very granular level um, how they're doing, um, where they're doing well, where, where, where there could be some room for improvements. And so, yes, I do believe we're wo- moving into a world where it's not just one um, revenue income source, but folks will be able to leverage uh, multiple different uh, services and, and businesses like Duetti in order to, to take their career forward. Let's talk about Duetti then. How, how, how does it work? So I, we're talking from the perspective of an artist making money here. So what does it do? How does it... How does it generate income and or how does it generate money for the artists? How, do, how, do, how did your business model work? Sure. And so we, we really offer two different core benefits for an artist who, who wants to partner with us. The first one is, is pure financial. And so uh, the artist, instead of waiting for years for the streaming income to come through, uh, they can basically get um, a, a lump sum of money up front. Right. And obviously there could be a debate because it's all a function of predictions and whether we can align on the right predictions and the cost of capital and, and not to get too technically uh, uh, f- financial here. But uh, there's, of course, a conversation and give and take. But for an artist, especially artists that are in the prime of their career, they're looking to go on tour or they're looking just to have a general living expenses, waiting for many years to get that income in uh, is very costly uh, and it makes more sense um, uh, to get the money now. And also for the just general diversification purposes um, and, and risk uh, um, management. And so 
that's really the first advantage of working with us. It's kind of from a pure financial point of view, um, diversifying your 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 wealth um, uh, into cash. The second the second benefit is on the marketing side, and so we do invest heavily um, in marketing and understanding how to push older catalog tracks. We do feel that um, record labels, while they've advanced a lot, still most of the creative energy is in new frontline releases, uh, while the catalog kind of side is, is, is often neglected. And so we're developing very sophisticated marketing um, programs for catalog tracks to help them gain notoriety, uh, uh, even, even if they didn't come out in the last year uh, or couple of years. Right. Okay. So I want to talk about those two sides of the business in, in, in turn. The first part is, it might sound to some people a little bit like, you know, people can get an advance from, from a distributor or whoever, you know, and saying, we think that you're going to make this much money. So here it is now. And you've talked about immediately about using data to make, you know, I guess, better estimations of future performance. You've come from a, uh, a background of investment banking, which is very reliant on on data driven predictions. I'm not asking you to sort of give away your secret, but like, but what's the difference between uh, doing this and doing a tra- getting a traditional advance for future earnings, for instance? Yeah, G- great question. And so, so for us, for Duedi, we we would uh, be interested to to talk about. Um, potentially a, a, a deal with you uh, on ca- on tracks that have been out there for at least two years, right? And so that's the initial criteria. And, and the reason why we do that is because we, ha- we only rely on data. We're not making any creative judgments in terms of whether it's, you know, what we think about the music or, we, you know, we all love music and we listen to the music, but ultimately it's really just data that's guiding us in terms of how we come up with initial pricing, um, and that's a big difference, right? Because usually advances also take into account new music that is going to come out. And no one knows how this music is going to do. And it can do extremely well or it could do not that well. And so it, it inserts an element of a lot more um, judgment and kind of creative perception into the conversation. While with us, we're trying to make it a lot more data-driven and transparent and ultimately look if 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 there is no agreement that's perfectly fine but because we're data driven frankly we're, we're able to offer more right we're not taking any creative risk here we're not taking the approach that some of the successes will effectively cover for some of the uh, underperformance uh, each and every uh, deal and, and partnership that we are looking to do should be fully uh, fair and to all parties, and, and we're able to just offer more uh, because of that. And how, what is the nature of that deal then? So, if, you, if you're working with an artist, it, you know, I guess you're looking to ultimately partner with a lot of artists to make to make this work for everybody. So there has to be an element of automation here. So, uh, what is that deal like? Is it a licensing deal? Is it a, is it a are they assigning rights in terms of ownership? How does it, how does it work? So the latter. So it is a buyout in, in terms of ownership. And so we do buy, we do buy the ownership itself. We're, we're only doing right now uh, uh, looking right now at sound recordings as opposed to uh, publishing rights. And so um, it's only the scope of the conversation is only on the master side, uh, but yes, it is, it is a full buyout. Uh, we, it is possible uh, to maintain uh, a share of income uh, if if the artist so chooses. And so we can do a 50-50 arrangement, uh, 80-20, uh, or a full buyout. So it really it really depends on the situation and what the artist is choosing. Right. So if the artist wants to retain partial ownership of, of, a, of a track, they can do that. Yeah. Uh, they, they can retain a partial income stream. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that we're seeing artists moving towards a multifaceted income model, beyond the sort of the traditional, you know, recording and live merchandise thing. So w- what kind of artists, you mentioned it's sort of that, I don't know how to describe it, mid-tier or mid to lower tier art, sort of artists that are successful, but not, you know, um, household name artists maybe, but have a sub- substantial fan base. So what, what, how, are you, how are you identifying those artists that are the ones you, you think have value that can be unlocked? 
So first and foremost, we again use data, and so we we um, we look at a lot of data uh, every single day uh, to identify um, uh, patterns and and behaviors uh, uh, on streaming services that pique our interest. And we're reaching out. We're reaching out um, on email, on social media, and through our network. Uh, we we do know a lot of people, our team in the industry. Uh, and we're having a conversation. Um, and again, for us, the first and foremost uh, objective here is to to offer another option, right? It's 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 uh, our deals with us are point in time, and so we're not looking to lock you, the artist, in some type of a multi-year uh, arrangement to tell you what to do with the money. We have no say in how you're going to spend the money. We're not a record label in that sense, right? We're it's really a financial transaction with the marketing element that we do out of our own pocket, because clearly we're incentivized to to push to push the music uh, on streaming. But um, it, it's a very very simple option for folks to consider. And that marketing element that you mentioned, it's this obviously makes a lot of sense because if if you if you own part of all of a song, you're incentivized to get it heard more. <clears throat> uh, who are you targeting then with that marketing? Are you are you going to DSPs and looking to get more simply just more plays, or is it uh, is it a bit more complicated than that? Uh, ultimately, it's all about getting more plays. Absolutely, um, we uh, but we're trying to do it in a very programmatic fashion. So it's not just uh, playlist placements that that various people uh, are doing. We do that as well. Uh, but alongside that, you know, we we maintain um, uh, hundreds of different playlists uh, on Spotify and and YouTube in particular uh, that are uh, very data driven. Again, <laughs> with apologies of keep keep going back to the data, but trying to really understand um, different audiences, different kind of sub genres, uh, where we can curate the music in a way that's really going to expose um, any any track that we're partnered on into new audiences. Um, we, for example, one example that I like to give is that um, we work very closely with TikTok. We have direct distribution with them. We're making sure every uh, every song that we're involved with is distributed to TikTok in the correct way so creators can see it and use it. And one interesting example that, that happened just in the, over the last few weeks, there was a big trend uh, on TikTok around the Roman Empire. I don't know if you came across yes, that. No, I, I did a, lot, see that yes. a, a lot of folks were talking about it. A lot of videos were created. We have dashboards through TikTok that c- we, we can see all of the music that we're connected with and how it's doing. And so we immediately saw um, big spikes in a couple of songs that we're involved with that were connected to this trend. Um, once we saw that, we immediately um, actioned uh, on on YouTube and Apple and, and Spotify and other platforms to create playlists and to pitch um, the relevant songs into kind of Roman theme uh, properties on, on the streaming services. And so I, I call it almost like event-driven kind of marketing, reactive marketing, but it's all about, you know, those type of trends, you know, last uh, a few days, very few weeks. And so you have to be very quick and kind of very attuned to what's going on uh, in the market in order to capitalize on that. Now, at this point, let me just take a moment to remind you that last year, Music Ally launched a series of five free courses covering everything you need to know about Amazon Music for artists, including programming and curation, selling artist merchandise, understanding voice technology, reaching audiences via Alexa, and live streaming on Twitch. Supported by Amazon Music, these courses are all completely free to access. And now, thanks to Amazon support, Music Ally is also able to offer complimentary certification to any individual or company that completes all five of the courses. So what have you got to lose? Nothing, that's what, because they're all free. So you can find a link to the Amazon Music for Artists series in our show notes beneath the podcast. As you look forward with Duetti, how many artists are you looking to bring on board? What's the sort of pool of uh, collaboration or ownership you're looking for here? Yeah, so look, right now we, we started um, just over a year ago uh, operation. And so we're very new. But with that being said, um, we've we've partnered with hundreds of artists at this point. Um, we've deployed um, 
many, many millions of capital uh, into the independent artist community. Uh, and so we're moving very fast. Um, our estimate, just looking at uh, what people are saying out there, I think Spotify um, announced a few, months ago, a few months ago that according to their research, they define um, walking musicians as 200,000 folks out there that are actually trying to make a living uh, in music globally. And so we see that ultimately as uh, kind of our target. We want to partner with, um, you know, most people in that in that bucket that that would be would be interesting to talk to us. And so we think it's a very vibrant market. And as 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 we know, this is the where really the growth is coming from, right? And if we're looking at historically, that's the area of the music uh, economy that is growing uh, significantly uh, more than than just the overall market. Mm. And f- f- for again, you know, like you've been doing it for a year, okay? So as you look. Uh, into the sort of medium term, let's say sort of five years into the future, what does what does success look like from your perspective? Like what how does a sort of a stable and successful duetty look? Sure. So for us it's it's first and foremost, we would like to establish ourselves as a very trustworthy, credible financing alternative uh, to walk in musicians um, globally. Right? That's really our mission. And so you don't have to work with us, but at least you can, you can consider us and you would consider uh, how we look and how we value uh, financially um, the music that uh, was created as you're trying to consider different options, whether it's an advance, whether it's a label deal or a duetty deal uh, as another option. And so um, we want to become the kind of longer term capital partner and capital option for independent musicians that just prefer to go down that route. And we think there's a huge market out there and we're very excited to, to build a business on that basis. And, and finally then, what, for these artists who are possibly on your radar or in terms of their size at least, what do they tell you that was the incentive for them to partner with you? Of course, money is a part of it, of course, it's be obvious, but what was the... what? What was the thing that drew them in specifically? I would say that one of the things that really surprised us from a positive perspective in terms of the reaction we've been receiving is um, how artists and their team love how simple and flexible the deal is, right? We in the music industry are used to, uh, you know, contracts that have hundreds of pages and advances and recoupments and marketing budgets and calculations and so on and so forth, right? Our deal couldn't be simpler. Like I think we all understand what it means to sell something and for a price and whether you are, you know, obviously you, you, you need to be comfortable for a price, but that's really it, right? And, and I think that power that we, we empower independent musicians to say, I want to focus on my new music and I want to do new music and release new music in my way without anyone telling me what to do and creatively and marketing wise, etc. And I want to leverage my historical success in order to enable me to do that independently. To me, that's been one of the key driver why folks are interested to talk to us and, and how fresh is this model that we offer. And the final point I would make is, which is connected is the a la carte nature of our model. And so you don't need to go and sell your entire catalog. Um, you you can pick and choose. Um, we give you a menu of options, right? It can be just one track. It can be a, a piece of a track. And so um, that flexibility together with the simplicity, um, you know, I think are really uh, uh, key winners here for, for us. Are you partnering just with, with independent artists or do you sometimes also partner with, say, small independent labels as well who may have ownership of these mass recordings? Um, so, so we've done, we, we've partnered with both, uh, mostly with independent artists themselves and, and their teams, but we have had, um, some success and we have a, a lot of very interesting conversations also with independent labels that may, uh, may be interested in focusing on A&R and discovery of talent, which, um, you know, is really kind of key, um, uh, I would say key, uh, com- competency of theirs, um, uh, and, Instead, instead of raising money and dilute uh, ownership or, or getting de- expensive debt, um, you can really use the assets that you've accumulated in order to to get some capital in some other way. 
Mm, interesting. Okay, well, I will put links to uh, Duetti and, and some of these resources so people can check it out for themselves because it does sound like a, uh, you know, I can imagine people are, are intrigued to see how this could work for them. Uh, so I will put that below the podcast. Now, Leo, um, we, we've, we've talked there about, uh, you know, being passionate about music. Um, to add some, con- some musical context to this question, to this uh, podcast, uh, I want to know about your taste in music, really, or what you enjoy. So if you could only listen to one this could one thing for the rest of your life. What would it be? It could be a, one song, or maybe one album, or something like that. But what would it be? Wow, that's that's a very very difficult question. Um, I would say mm. I like a lot of different a lot of different types of music. Uh, I am a big uh, EDM person myself. Uh, I like some of right. the some of the some of the music that came out in the nineties and early two thousand. Uh, I would mention Paul Ockenfeld as someone that uh, I'm, a, I'm a big oh, fan of, okay. and, and I've, I, I wouldn't be able to choose just one one track, but um, uh, a big fan of of the music that was created at the time, and and and, and a big follower. Okay, right. Okay, that's that's good. I'm, I'm picturing you on a uh, on a beach as the sun's rising uh, somewhere. Uh, one day, one Ockenfeld. day, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thanks ever so much, Leo, for joining us. I appreciate it, Joe. Thank you very much. And there we are. Thank you again to Leo uh, for joining us on the podcast. If you found that useful, please share it on with somebody else that you uh, think would get something out of it. If you want to get in touch with me, I'd love to hear from you. As always, you can email me at joe at musically.com. That's joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. We also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up bits and pieces of the best analysis news, marketing insight, and skills from across Music Ally's wide range of services. So sign up and impress your friends. Links are in the description, as always, along with links to Duetti and the music that Leo mentioned. And there we go. Thanks for listening. I've been Joe Sparrow. You've been you. And until next time, farewell.